right. Anyway, so uh, I will just talk about one, one use of bootstrap here. So, the idea behind bootstrap is very simple, right. So, I have a large sample, right. I have a large sample of data. So, what I am going to do is I am going to sample from this data with replacement. Okay. Let us assume that the set S has n elements in it. So, what I will do is I will sample from it another set S prime that also has n elements. Okay. Does not sound like a big thing, right? I mean, if I do not sample with uh, if, if I sample without replacement, I will essentially be duplicating it, but I am sampling with replacement. So, what is the idea behind doing this? No. So, if you remember, I said that the assumption that we are making is that exactly the assumption that we are making is that the data is truly representative of the underlying distribution, right? In which case, given the data, right, the best approximation I can construct to the underlying distribution is the discrete distribution, right, defined on this data. Right. In one sense, if I do not make any other assumptions, all I can do is I can construct a discrete distribution on the data. Right. So, the probability of sampling this point x1 is equal to the number of times x1 appeared in my set S divided by the size of S. Right. So, how do I simulate this distribution? Sample from S with replacement. Does that make sense to people? Right. So, I am going to assume that S in some sense the set S is representative of the underlying data distribution and I am going to simulate the underlying data distribution by using the, the discrete distribution formed by S. Right. So, what do I mean by the discrete, discrete distribution? I do not know. Maybe the underlying P is actually Gaussian or whatever, but my S has only n elements. So, only these n points will have some non-zero probability of occurring. So, that is what I mean by the discrete distribution. So, I can just construct the discrete distribution from S and I will sample from that, that will give me S prime, right. So, I will call it S 1 prime and like that I can do that multiple times to get right, I can go up till S L prime, right. I can do that. I can create many, many, many such samples. Okay, so now what I do to get a bootstrap estimate of the classification error. So this kind of a sampling to produce this L sub subsets I have done is called bootstrap, bootstrap sampling. Okay. So I want to once I have derived such samples I can find out the bootstrap estimate of the quantity that I want right. So, in this case error. So, what will I do? I will train on S 1 prime right and what will I test on? I hmm? will train on S 1 prime and I will test on S minus S 1 prime. Right, because I am sampling with replacement, so some of the data points will get left out. Right, so whatever gets left out, I'll sample, I'll test on that. So likewise, I'll train another classifier on S2 prime, right, using the same method. If I'm using backprop for training, I'll use backprop and train on S1 prime, okay, and test on S minus S1 prime. Likewise, I'll train on S2 prime and test on S minus S2 prime. Likewise, so I'll get how many estimates for the error? L estimates. I will take an average of that, that gives me the bootstrap estimate for the error, right. And uh, you can show that the bootstrap estimate will have a lower variance than just the error estimate on just using S and just randomly splitting S into test and train, it will have a lower variance, right. So, what I again again I want to be clear, what do I mean by lower variance here? If I give you another training data point of size n, right, and then you do the same thing, you do you do two estimates. One just train on the original set that is given to you and test on the test set once, 
or do this bootstrap estimate. Likewise, I give you another data point, the data set of size n, another data set of size n and so on and so forth. So, now you will have two, two estimates for each of these. Okay. The second estimate will be more consistent than the first estimate. Okay. That is what I mean by lower variance. Okay. Great. So, that is a bootstrap estimate. Okay. So, this is sometimes uh, I forget the exact number. Um, so, It is estimate of the error, yeah. but it is some parameter that I am estimating about the whole process that is why I said. right. So, this is one way of estimating the performance right, or the thing. Um, right. I mean you can estimate anything you want on S1 prime, S2 prime, S3 prime, S4 prime, you can do whatever. right. You can estimate the variance of the data on S1 prime, right. just the variance of S1 prime, I am not talking about anything. Right. You can do this for each of those L things and then you can have a bootstrap estimate of the variance. Right. So, you can do whatever whatever statistics you want, you can measure on these L sets right? and, and then you can call that the bootstrap estimate. Okay. So, bootstrap is a very general technique, it is not just for error measurement. Okay. Yeah, so, if you had been in, uh, in a proper uh, statistics course by now, so, would have gotten into the, uh, the variance reduction properties of bootstrap and we could have shown some interesting results, right. But I am just going to tell you that yeah, it, the variance goes down and you can see intuitively it goes down and I will leave it at that, okay. So, roughly about uh, 60, 69 percent of the data, okay, on an average, right, 69 percent of the data will be in S1 prime and the remainder or uh, 63 percent of the data sorry 63 will be in S1 prime and remainder uh, will be in the test data right. So, this is also sometimes called that uh, I forget 0.632 bootstrap or something like that because sampling with replacement leaves a certain fraction of the data in the in the sample and leaves another fraction of the data in the test set okay. So, it is uh, sometimes that fraction also denotes what bootstrap estimated this right. Um, you remember? <coughs> okay, great. So this is one way of doing it, and uh, this works fine, uh, provided uh, I had a large enough sample to begin with. Right? Provided I had large enough sample to begin with. So suppose your sample is smaller. Suppose your sample was smaller, you do something called cross validation, k fold cross validation. So, what you do is you take your sample, okay, you divide it into multiple bins. And you divide it into k bins. Now, what I do? I train on some k minus 1 bins and I test on the last bin. Right? Is it clear? So, I use the first k minus 1 bins as my training data and 1 bin as the test data. Next, what I do? Instead of using the last bin, I use the second last bin as the test data and everything else as the training data, right. Suppose I break this into k bins, I will have k different estimates, right, and I take an average of those, right. So, which will give you a better estimate, bootstrap or cross validation? Hmm? Depends, yeah. Okay, that's not that's not the end of it though. You have to tell me what it depends on. <laughs> huh? Depends on the size of the data. I mean, if you have a sufficiently large sample that your bootstrap assumption is true, right? So you might get a better estimate with bootstrap, right? Uh, one of the nice things about uh, cross validation is that every data point is in the test set at least once. Is it correct? 
exactly once every data point is in the test set exactly once. So, in some sense you whatever number that you are reporting is essentially the average over your performance on the entire sample that has been given to you right entire sample that has been given to you at some point you are using this. So, there are a few caveats that you have to worry about the first one is what is k right and the second one is the actual process of creating folds. So, what should be k? Five to ten. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So th those are the numbers typically used. Five or ten. Okay. Those are the numbers typically used. And uh, so, depending on the number of folds you have, okay, you have stronger variance reduction properties. The more the number of folds, the more the variance reduction property. Provided the folds are large enough, right? If you have k data points, there is no point in creating k folds. But people do. Okay, there is a very special uh, kind of uh, cross validation. I'll come to that later. But I'm just going to leave you with the short form of it. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll come to that. So which is exactly creating k folds if you have k data points. It's called leave one out leave one out cross validation okay leave one out that is what LOO stands for right. Um, right that essentially means that you will train on n minus or k minus 1 data points and test on one data point okay. So, in some cases no no no, no there, there are actually in there are uh, in cases where this actually gives you good estimates okay and uh, earlier a version of this was the one of the first do not ask me why it is called jackknife, but one of the earliest is, uh, this kind of variance reduction technique used for uh, parameter estimation right was called jackknife okay jackknife is very similar to leave one out okay. Uh, so, going back here so I would recommend that do not split it into so many folds that you have very little data point left in each fold right and uh, so the typical number do not do not go more than 10 folds right. If you manage to get 10 folds out of your data right then you should just be happy right that gives you good enough uh, variance reduction. So, typically people in, when you report empirical results do not expect you to do more than 10 folds right. But then if your data size is small right people end up doing only 5 folds right. There are extraordinary cases even when your data size is not small when you have to do fewer folds. right. So, let us think for a minute suppose I have a I am solving a classification problem right. So, I have created these folds right and this is entirely of class 3 okay and there is no class 3 in this data right. See you think this is odd? this can happen quite frequently if you are dumb about how you split your data. So, the data has come to you sorted by class label, I will give you the class file sorted by class label and you do the 5 fold splitting by serial number right. So, what will happen is you will have all your class go into one fold right the other uh, 4 folds will not have any data point of class 3. Now, if you try to test on this what will happen? Yeah, right, because you do not even know there exists class 3. Okay, in your training, you did not even know there was class 3, so you are going to get 100 percent error, right. Um, so, how do you avoid that? Shuffle the data. In fact, I do better than that, I, I do what I call what I call stratified sampling. So, I am not going to make much progress today. So, we will have to stop with uh, cross validation. I have so much more that I need to talk about. We will do the next class. Uh, so, stratified sampling. So, stratified sampling essentially says that when you create the folds, try to make sure that 
the class distribution that you had in the original data is maintained right. Suppose I have 5, 5 data points of class 1 and 10 data points of class 2 right and I am splitting it into 5 folds right. I should make sure that there are 2 data points of class 2 and 1 data point of class 1 in every fold. Right. So, the class distribution the 2 is to 1 ratio is maintained in every fold. Okay. So, this is called stratified sampling. So, this is something that you have to do. So, the recommendation is do 10 fold then you do stratified sampling and now can you answer my question why even though you have a lot of data you might be forced to have smaller number of folds. class imbalance right. So, I might have very few data points of one class what if I have only 10 data points of one class right. If I do 10 fold sampling 10 fold uh, uh, cross validation right I will essentially put one data point of that class into each fold that might not be sufficient for me to get a good good enough estimate right. I might want to do a smaller number of folds 5 maybe 3 right. Of course, there are other things which I could do. But uh, this is some case where you might want to you work with a fewer number of folds than uh, what your data would support, right. So, if you want to have a more uh, formal uh, description of uh, cross validation, bootstrap, and leave one out, and all of that, uh, you're encouraged to read Hasty, right? The Elements of Statistical Learning. Uh, book has uh, a very very nice uh, uh, discussion on uh, all of these things right so right now i'll stop here right